एनर्जी बैलेंस चैप्टर सेवन पेज नंबर वन ट्वेंटी सिक्स दो सू हैव द टेक्स्ट बुक चैप्टर सेवन पेज नंबर वन ट्वेंटी सिक्स एनर्जी बैलेंस इफ एनी वन इज जॉइनिंग लेट प्लीज हेल्प दम विद पेज नंबर so you will find a lot of technical terminologies in this chapter okay i'll uh, tell you exactly what all are the important topics as a practicing dietitian or a nutritionist you should know from this chapter okay the entirety of this chapter is to uh, those who especially, especially those who are from a non science background you will find it too technical in terms of formulas or in terms of calorie metrics okay the chemistry of it you will find it too technical so those things we will skip okay only the application part of this chapter okay how you can ap apply the knowledge from this chapter how it how you can apply it into your daily lives okay how you can apply it into or guide your clients in future clients okay only those aspects we will discuss from this chapter of energy balance is it clear to all in new book page number 130 those who have the old textbook it's page number 126 is it clear to all so details about calorie meter how it functions okay direct indirect calorie meter we will we'll see that in the uh, in the coming up slides so different types of calorie meter okay these things you don't have to study okay this is not part of a practical approach what you will be using in future will uh, learn in detail about basal metabolic rate bmr okay what affects the bmr okay what is energy how energy is burnt okay so kilo calorie when we say get these many calories five calories four calories 2000 kilo calories is what i should eat on a daily basis whatever is your body composition body requirements so we always use this term kilo calorie kcl in short okay what is it actually what do you mean by it okay typically 60 to 70% of the energy within your body it is released as heat you touch your body it is slightly uh, hot okay it is not cold until and unless you are in a very cold environment okay or you are stressed or anxious apart from that in the resting phase you you can understand your body produces heat okay so 60 to 70% of the energy within your body is used up as heat the remaining energy is used for all muscular activity and cellular process muscular activity it's it not just means you are doing something a physical exercise in the gym or something like that muscular activity even when you're sitting silently not doing anything a lot of involuntary activities are taking place in your in your body okay for example respiration respiration is also one such example taking uh, inhaling exhaling you okay, you're not controlling it but your body does it involuntarily heart beating okay that is also mus muscular activity peristalsis movement in your intestine it's a muscular activity okay cellular processes at cellular level calories are being burned burned okay that is also an activity so all in all these situations energy is being used 30% of the for 30 to 40% of whatever you have eaten or consumed that is used for all these activities okay so what is kilo calorie we use it as a unit of measurement okay energy when if you want to use it in a uh, measurement in biological system we use the term kilo calories okay so what is 1 kilo calorie we say 1 cm okay 1 meter 
so 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 and so so what is one kilo calorie for example one meter is equals to 100 centimeter okay we have a unit of measurement for it so how do you measure calorie kilo calorie what do you mean by one kilo calorie so one kilo calorie is the amount of heat energy required to raise the temperature of one kg of water okay by one degree celsius so I give you one kg of water. One kg of water is approximately one liter of water. Okay, approximately one liter of water, one kg of water. So I want to increase the temperature of this one kg of water by just one degree Celsius. Okay, maybe the water is at 14 degrees Celsius. Okay, imagine one kg of water, which I gave it to you. It is, it is at 14 degrees Celsius, one fourth. And I ask you to increase the temperature of this water by 15 degrees Celsius. So just one degree increase I am asking you to do okay, for this one kg of water. So the amount of heat you will use, the amount of heat energy you will use. Because if you, if you want to increase the temperature, you have to heat it up. Okay, you want to raise the temperature, you have to heat it up. Okay, heat energy is required. So the amount of heat energy you use up. Okay, just to make this change of 1 degree Celsius, increase of 1 degree Celsius on 1 kg of water, that amount of heat energy is what we call as 1 kilo calorie. Is it clear? The definition of 1 kilo calorie, what do you mean by kilo calorie? It is basically heat energy. But what heat energy? How much heat energy? The heat energy required to change, to increase the temperature of 1 kg water by 1 degree Celsius. Okay. So, this is the definition of kilocalorie. So, how do you check? How do you check different types of, uh, how do you check different types of uh, heat that is released? Okay. There should be some instrument used. Okay, if the definition is not cleared, just WhatsApp me. I'll send you an animated video. Okay, with that you will understand it. Though those who have still uh, find it difficult to understand the definition of kilocalorie, WhatsApp me. Don't forget WhatsApp me. I will forward you the animated video of one kilocalorie definition. So, direct or indirect calorie metric. Okay, calorie metric means you are checking or measuring the amount of heat produced or the amount of energy released. Calorimetry is used for this purpose. You have two types of calorimetry, indirect and direct. Okay. So, in, uh, in direct calorimetry, it works on one principle. Okay. When, you, when carbohydrate or fat is burnt in your body, okay, your body is undergoing metabolism. So, when, when carbohydrate is broken down or fat is broken down, metabolized or oxidized or burnt in your body, okay, heat is produced, okay, heat is produced, heat is released, energy is released in form of heat. So, in direct calorimetry, we see how much heat is really released or we'll see how much heat is produced directly. You will, you will not think about the gases, okay, you will not think about oxygen, uh, water, carbon dioxide, no, nothing matters, only heat. Direct calorimetry means just check how much heat is being produced. That much energy is being released. That is direct calorimetry. When we come to indirect calorimetry, okay, you cannot check the heat, but you have to check certain other aspects which will give you an idea of how much heat is being produced, okay. So, the principle used in indirect calorimetry is that whenever uh, oxygen, you take in oxygen, okay, you are taking in oxygen to replenish the energy that has been liberated, okay. The uh, if if uh, 10 kilocalorie of energy is liberated or produced in your body, 10 units of oxygen you are uh, inhaling, okay. So, how much uh, oxygen you are consuming in, okay, directly relates to how much energy you are producing, okay. So, that is indirect calorimetry. Is it clear 
about what is direct colorimetry and indirect colorimetry. In direct colorimetry, from the name itself, we understand you directly have to check the heat produced. See how much heat is being produced, you will know how much energy is being produced. Okay. In indirect colorimetry, you do not know how to check the heat. You can only work with gases, oxygen, carbon dioxide. Okay. You eat food, you inhale oxygen. Okay. Both of things, the food that you have, uh, you are that you are eating, the oxygen that you are inhaling from the atmosphere, it goes into your body, it produces heat, it produces carbon dioxide, it produces water under various mechanism, under various metabolism. Okay, your body is producing heat, your body is producing carbon dioxide, your body is producing metabolic water. Okay, out of what? Out of food that you eat, out of the oxygen that you have inhaled. So, you have inhaled oxygen. Okay, so uh, the right hand side should be equal to left hand side in any formula. Now, right hand side is equal to left hand side. So, you can see here the amount of food that you have you are eating and the amount of oxygen that you are inhaling should be equal to directly equal to the amount of heat produced, carbon dioxide and water produced. Water in terms of sweat as well. Okay, sweat or urine that you have released. Okay. So, just if you do infrared calorimetry, just see how much oxygen a person is consuming. You will understand how much energy their, their body is producing. Okay. Is it clear now? Carbon dioxide also, you see, uh, you will, I will show you how it is checked. Carbon dioxide also is also released from the body, okay, through re respiration. So, this is a direct calorimetry, this device, okay, bomb calorimeter. You only burn things here. You, uh, you use a food item, you will burn it. You will see how much heat is used to burn it. That much is the calorie produced, okay. These kind of uh, instruments, equipments are only used in laboratory, not in nutritionist practice or not not in um, any uh, any day-to-day uh, -day practices these these devices are not used okay so this is how indirect calorimetry work you can see here this person is wearing a mask okay covering the mouth so here here we can understand how much oxygen this person is taking in and how much carbon dioxide this person is letting out okay how much water they are losing we can still see it through the amount of water uh, urine that has come out of their body that can be checked ml wise sweat can be checked so, uh, how much how much water weight you have you uh, lost uh, lost through sweat it can be also checked by checking the weight before workout after workout that is a formula okay there is a formula to check the sweat okay so this is how indirect calorimetry works even today even today a lot of athletes people who are in sports and all okay a lot of athletes they are still under uh, they are also undergo this indirect calorimetry technique to see how their body is burning okay how their body is burning the fat carbon dioxide how 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 much energy their body is able to produce within one hour okay after having a specific kind of diet specific kind of food item how much energy that they can produce within one hour okay the, so the uh, all the athletes and sports personalities they undergo this indirect calorimetry technique okay is it clear now what is direct and indirect calorimetry Now you understand how oxygen, carbon dioxide is checked, how water is checked. Okay, you give this person, just imagine this person is a sports personality. You gave him a specific kind of a meal, okay, a specific kind of a food item. And definitely he is put on the treadmill or epileptor to work out. He will inhale a lot of oxygen because when you are working out, you breathe a lot. Okay, you're inhaling a lot of oxygen, you're exhaling carbon dioxide, 
okay you are sweating uh, you will urinate also after workout okay so all these uh, how much oxygen you are inhaling how much carbon dioxide you have exhaled how much water has been produced how much it has been lost it all can be checked okay and a conclusion can be made about the food item that you have ate okay so this is how indirect calorimetry works we can't you can see here here we can see the heat because you are burning the food in this bomb calorimeter you are burning the food definitely temperature can be checked in this situation in this scenario you will not get the exact heat produced you will body def definitely has a temperature but it's a normal temperature okay hardly one or two degrees celsius change will shift will be there but that will not give you a, a correct concrete idea about the heat produced okay so we uh, uh, using a human subject we will never know how how much heat is produced in the body okay how much energy is been produced in the body okay we cannot check the heat here at all but we can check other factors like oxygen carbon dioxide water okay so that's why this is the indirect calorimetry procedure this one here this instrument here is the direct calorimetry like bomb calorimetry so i hope it is clear to all now now coming to the physiological fuel value okay page number 129 those who are using a new textbook you can mention the page number bomb calorie meter meet, uh, meter they have given in detail no need to study that okay please don't study anything about calorie meters because that is for a person who wants to join into uh, institute of nutrition and all they want to do research in nutrition for them this calorie meter and everything will be important okay but for this course it is not important okay? it does not have day to day use questions regarding bmr please don't ask now okay the bmr topic will come later okay factors affecting your bmr will be discussed that time okay so physiological fuel value so every macronutrient macronutrient means what what carbohydrates fat protein these are macronutrients macros you need them in big amounts as compared to vitamin minerals okay macros you require in big amount they are the major foundation of your meal plan okay so amount of energy each gram of these micro macronutrients how much energy they can pro provide for your body that is the physiological fuel value okay and i hope you already know this uh, this information already this fact is known by everyone and uh, uh, protein one gram of protein can give you 4 kilo calorie one gram of carbon dioxide can give you 4 kilo calorie fat can give you 9 kilo calorie alcohol can give you one gram of alcohol can give you 7 kilo calories okay so these are the macros alcohol will not consider it under nutri nutrient it is not a nutrient so you will not see alcohol here but 1 gram of alcohol can give 7 kilo calories fat can give 9 kilo calories carbohydrates and proteins will give 4 kilo calories 1 gram of it okay this is the physiological fuel value physiological fuel value is slightly different from laboratory fuel value okay the, the reason being in human body 100% of whatever you eat is not digested some of it is lo lost in metabolism okay the in the process of digestion 100% of whatever you eat is not completely broken down okay some loss is anticipated so this is what the round figure of physiological fuel value of each of this macros kilo joules and calories is like you it's just conversion okay when we are talking about nutrients nu nutrition we don't require a huge uh, measurement like joules okay joules is a bigger number for example centimeter and meter centimeter and meter in some aspects of use you uh, usages you require centimeter in some aspect of you uh, uses in your life you require things in meters okay if you if you are checking the distance okay between uh, two places you don't check that in centimeters you check it in kilometers right 
So joules and calories, they all are unit of measurements. But when we talk about nutrition, when you are in the field of nutrition, energy is calculated in calories. Okay, it, it is not converted into joules. Okay, joules is uh, used uh, joule, uh, for high efficiency plants and all. Okay, where the energy produced is in huge number for that, that kind of a situation, kilojoules can be used. Is it clear? So if you check the physiological value of nutrients and the laboratory value of nutrients, slight difference will be there, slight difference, okay? When you, you, when you burn, just imagine you take a piece of bread and you burn it in bomb calorimeter, okay? The amount of energy produced in bomb calorimeter will be much higher as compared to the energy if you eat a piece of bread, the same, the same quantity of bread okay when you when you eat it body will produce less energy as compared to bomb calorie meter okay because some of the some parts of the bread will be lost in ingestion digestion okay then you have a lot of topic on benedict's calorie meter value of calorie meter okay those things please don't study it is confusing don't study it is not required as well Coming to the total energy requirement, page number 132. Total energy requirement, page 132. Those who have the new textbook, page number will be slightly different, 133 or 134, something like that. So when you look at this pie chart, just give me a moment. Fuel value of topic, just for practical purpose, remember it. Each gram of macronutrients, how much calories you will get. Okay, that's it. So, com components of energy expenditure, how does your body spend energy? Okay, in terms of percentage wise. So, almost 60 to 65 percent of the energy produced in your body is used for metabolism, resting metabolism or basal metabolism okay bmr or resting metabolism so majority of the energy consumed by your body is when you do do nothing okay for for digestion metabolism production of hormones okay uh, maintaining the bio biological and physiological processes intact in your body thinking thought process Okay, brain itself use, uses a lot of energy. Okay, breathing, heart, heart that beats, kidney functions. Okay, for all these things, energy is required. So even when you are resting, not doing anything, body is still consuming energy. 60 to 65% of the energy that you get from your food, okay, that is used by your own body to maintain the metabolism and regular maintenance of the body. 32% of the calories produced is used by physical activity. Okay, walking, standing, cooking, whatever is your daily chores, okay, your daily routine, uh, climbing the staircase, sitting, doing some activity, working, okay, this all comes under physical activity. Any physical activity that you do on a daily basis, 32, almost 32% of energy, 25 to 30 also percent of energy will be consumed in your physical activities and remaining small part 8 8% 8 or approximately 10% 5 to 10% of energy is the thermic effect of food what is thermic effect 
um, if I give you carbohydrate and protein, which do you think is difficult to digest? Yes, protein is a bit difficult to digest. Carbohydrate can be digested very easily. Okay, protein is a bit difficult to break down and it is a bit difficult to digest. So, the thermic effect of protein is higher than carbohydrate because your body requires more energy, okay, to break down protein as compared to carbohydrates. So, this is the thermic effect of food. When you eat some certain kinds of food, okay, if you, for example, if you eat a tablespoon of sugar, okay, and you eat two to three slices of apple, which do you think is easier? Both are sources of carbohydrates. Apples are rich in fructose. Sugar is a carbohydrate, okay? Both are carbohydrates, but different types of carbohydrates. What do you think? Which is easier for your body to digest? It is sugar. Sugar is easier for your body to digest. Sugar will get absorbed in your bloodstream in within few minutes. Apple, it is difficult because apple comes with fiber. Okay, apple has fiber content. So the body has will take time to break down the fibers to get into the nutrients. Okay, all the ju digestive juices in your body will work on apple to make it uh, to make it into manageable uh, uh, particles, okay? Protein and carbs both are good for body. Don't think that carbs is not required. Your body requires carbs. For your brain to function, it requires carbohydrates, okay? The only source of energy that the brain requires is from carbs, okay? So, protein is also good for your body. You have to make sure you meet your protein, protein targets, but you also require, require carbohydrates. Okay. So, these are the energy components expenditure. This is, this is the process in which energy is consumed in the body. Now, coming to BMR, basal metabolic rate, okay. So, what is BMR? It is the amount of energy required to carry on any involuntary work of your body. You don't control your heartbeats. You don't control your respiration. You don't control your digestion, okay. Your, bo your body controls it. Body does it involuntarily, okay. So, any function like secretion of hormones from glands, your peristaltic movement uh, of the GI tract, oxidation, maintenance of muscle, maintenance of body temperature, functions of heart, brain, kidney, liver, lungs. You don't have control over this. Your body takes care of it. Okay. For the body to take care of it, energy is required. And that is your basal metabolic rate. So, in men and women, you have different formulas to calculate the basal metabolic rate. Okay. The formula is given on screen. But this formula is in form of weight, which is in pounds, height, which is in inches. But usually, in, in Indian scenario, we use a slightly different formula in which weight is in kgs, kilograms, and height is in centimeters. Okay. So the BMR formula is different for men and women. There are the better metabolic rate of men is slightly higher than women. There are different reasons to it. The first is the presence of testosterone. Male hormone, testosterone and androgen, they play a very important factor in BMR. And men naturally have more lean muscle as compared to women. Women ha have more adipose uh, tissue. Men have more lean muscle. Okay. So these are the reasons why 
men and women have different PMR rate and different PMR calculation formula. So determining uh, determining the basal metabolic rate, you have different calculations, but usually we go for the Saint Gior and Mifflin formula. That is what we go for usually. Some other formulas are also given in the textbook, but it's better you stick with Saint Gior and Mifflin formula. So coming to physical activity ratio, you can put weight in kilograms, but the numbers will change. The other factors of the numbers will change. Okay, just search for St. Gior and Mifflin formula, you will get it. So coming to physical activity ratio, PAR. So, the formula for physical activity ratio is energy cost of an activity per minute divided by energy cost of BMR per minute. Okay. So, everyone has a basal metabolic rate that is quite constant. Okay. The formula is St. Gior and Mifflin. I'm putting it in the chat, chat box. So looking at this graph on y-axis, you can see various different activities are mentioned. Okay. And on x-axis, time is mentioned. Okay. Physical activity ratio in terms of time and, uh, uh, and in terms of BMR per minute. So when whatever activity you do for one minute, how much energy you have uh, you have utilized okay divided by in one minute how much bmr uh, has uh, uh, has consumed the energy okay this ratio is called the par ratio for example um, if you take a person we calculate their bmr okay we know every minute how much energy they are consuming in terms of bmr they will not do anything, but still their body is taking up energy. So that will become the denominator. And if we want to check if they are doing running, okay, if they are running somewhere or if they are cycling, okay, the same person, if, they, if he or she is cycling, in one minute, how much energy they are consuming, that becomes the numerator, okay. So this is how the PAR formula is calculated. Numerator and denominator both are energy consumed. Numerator and denominator both are energy that has been consumed. But in numerator, energy consumed is a specific activity. Your activity could be running, dancing, cycling, okay, doing your homework, washing clothes, transporting, eating something, slow walk, playing a, a game, taking a rest, napping, taking a break, okay, doing some physical education, anything can be the activity, okay, anything can be an activity, the energy that you have consumed to do that activity for a minute, that becomes the numerator. Denominator will stay constant, okay, because once we calculate your BMR, we know exactly per minute how much energy has been consumed in your body and it take, it usually remains constant, okay. Is it clear to all the physical activity ratio? This you don't have to calculate. You just have to understand how we get this ratio. Because based on this ratio, we have found the physical activity level. And why do you use physical activity ratio, physical activity level to calculate how much calories a person requires? That is a completely different chapter we will do later.
diet in obesity and all. We will do that uh, formula with examples. Okay. Online we will do a, we will solve a case. Okay. So you will understand. But how did we come to use this formula? What was the starting point of it? You should understand that. Okay. So PAR is one point. Okay. Once you understand PAR, okay, how much energy a person is consuming doing an activity. Okay. Then we can get the PAL level. So physical activity level, it's not just one activity. Okay. It is a culmination of various activity that categorizes a person into a sedentary lifestyle, low active lifestyle, active lifestyle, very active lifestyle. For example, look at this, uh, this uh, uh, graph again. Okay. I'll give you three different, three to four different activities. Okay. You tell me what kind of lifestyle this person has. Is it sedentary, active, light active or uh, moderately active? Okay. So, the three activities, sorry, the four activities that a person is doing, for example, watching TV, going to parlor, washing, washing utensils, eating a meal. Sedentary. Yeah, this is a sedentary lifestyle. Okay. Second example. Taking a transportation using a bus. Okay. Cycling. Slow walk. Video games. Yes, it is a low active lifestyle. Now you understand how we, with, with the help of PAR, we can see if a person is having a sedentary lifestyle, low active, active or very active. Is it clear? How PAR is related to physical activity level. So physical activity level is not because, just, uh, just because you are walking, one hour on a daily basis it doesn't make you an active person does it you say that i walk for one hour on a daily basis is your lifestyle active will you come under the very active lifestyle no in very active lifestyle, resistance training should be also a part. You will come under low active lifestyle. Okay. One hour of walking on a daily basis comes under low active lifestyle because we do not know what other activities you are doing. Okay. <coughs> so physical activity level, just because your client will state only one activity that I walk for one hour on a daily basis. Okay. You can't directly tell, okay, you have an active lifestyle. No, you can't, you can't put them into this category. You have to ask more what else you do. What is your schedule? At what time you get up? What all work you do? Okay. You have to ask them more and see on an average, even without calculating, just see on an average, what all activities they are staying, are stating on it. What is the daily routine? Okay. Once you see a combination of activities piling up, then only you can categorize them. Do they come under sedentary, low active, active or very active? Is it clear? So next topic. Next topic is thermic effect of food. Again, in between indirect calorimetry, something about calorimetry they have mentioned. You can skip that. Come to thermic effect of food. Page number 142. Those who have the old textbook.
so looking at this graph given here okay three different graphs are given here which do you think has the which food which macronutrient do you think has the highest thermic effect thermic effect i have i have mentioned what what, what does it mean the more your body consumes energy to break down a particular macronutrient okay your body spends energy to break it down your body your intestines your body is spending energy to metabolize this macronutrient okay that the how much energy they are spending that depends that depends on the thermic effect of the food yes here you can see here protein has the highest rate of thermic effect your body spends a lot of time and energy to break down protein that's the reason why when you eat a protein rich diet you will not feel hungry for a long time okay you will not feel hungry it is still easier to break down fats you only require good good amount of bile salts your liver produces bile juice okay good amount of bile salts it's easy fat will become smaller and smaller in size okay big globules of fats will become smaller and smaller globules of smart micro globules of fat which is easily absorbed by your intestine and once it is absorbed from in your intestine only some part of the fat will be digested other part other major part of the fat is stored in your body okay so your and fat consumption is also very restricted you should not eat if you have a sedentary lifestyle don't eat more than 20 gram of visible fat on a daily basis so it's a very minuscule amount of fat that your body has to digest so the thermic effect of fat will not be high okay carbohydrates is like a big portion of your meal but to digest it it is very easy for your body to digest it okay even if it is a complex carbohydrates when you compare it to protein complex carbohydrates are still easier to digest as compared to protein okay so there are a specific types of food that are considered thermogenic food which means it increases the thermic effect of the food like l carnitine which is found in meat and dairy products l carnitine is also found in form of supplements okay when we will do the chapter of carbohydrates we will discuss this in detail what are good carbs complex carbs etc presence of methionin presence of linoleic acid linoleic acid comes in different combinations okay i in uh, omega 3 omega 6 and also other types of fatty acids linoleic acid is, is comes in, in that category l tyrosine caffeine okay coffee in, uh, increases the energy metabolism in your body okay caffeine chromium lecithin okay so these all are different chemicals when it is present in your meal or which, which when it is present in your in the source of food whatever you are eating it increases the thermic effect of the food your body has to undergo a lot of energy consumption to digest it okay next coming to resting energy expenditure next topic is resting resting energy expenditure page number 144 this is basal metabolic rate okay resting energy expenditure is also the another name of basal metabolic rate when you are resting your body is still spending energy still consuming energy okay so that is resting energy expenditure ree usually we say by the rule of thumb to estimate your resting energy expenditure okay per, whatever is your weight multiply it by 25 okay 1 kg of body weight in your body to maintain that 1 kg of body weight 25 kilocalories is used by your body okay so whatever is the weight of the person their basal metabolic rate is multiply the weight of the person by 25 for example 
if somebody's weight is 57 kg okay if anybody anyone's weight is 57 kg what would be their resting energy expenditure or basal metabolic rate approximately thousand four twenty five okay so thousand four twenty five calories approximately thousand five hundred calories they have to eat okay if they want weight maintenance if they want to wait, maintain their weight thousand five hundred kilocalories they have to eat what will happen if they are eating less than thousand five hundred kilocalories or thousand less than thousand four hundred kilocalories their weight will start reducing okay body will and their metabolic rate will also fall down after a point okay so resting energy expenditure is basic metabolic rate when you are resting when you are not doing anything but still this energy is being spent by your body okay maintenance it is bmr into pal but you will not go below below bmr you cannot go below BMR. If you are going below your BMR calorie, you will lose weight. And also after a point, your BMR will also fall down. Okay. When you lose weight, definitely your BMR will also fall down. Okay. From 57 to uh, if you lose 4 kg weight and you get, get into 53 category. Okay. And you use the same formula. Definitely your BMR has fallen down by uh, almost by 100 kilocalories. Okay. So this is different activities in which basal heat production is uh, happens in adults. Okay, you get your energy through food. Food and oxygen is what you consume. Okay, this will uh, macronutrients and micronutrients from food will go to different organs of your body. Oxygen will also go to different organs of your body, and in the organs they will go up to the cellular level. Okay. You can see different cells, different types of cells found in the body. They will go up to the cellular level. And each cell has mitochondria. And what do you, what is mitochondria? What is a tagline attached with mitochondria? It is the powerhouse of the cell. Powerhouse of the cell, which means it produces energy mitochondria produces energy the more mitochondria are present in the cell more energy will be produced okay so each and every cell in your body these are different types of cells okay this is an epithelial cells with villi okay uh, this is your cardiac cells red blood cells neurons adipose cells columnar cells different types of cells okay each of these cells have mitochondria okay the mitochondria will use oxygen will also use the micronutrients glucose okay and then they will secrete atp and atp is what gives you energy adenosine triphosphate okay when adenosine triphosphate breaks into breaks up one phosphate ion okay and it becomes adenosine biphosphate okay adenosine triphosphate three phosphate ions from that, when it becomes adenosine biphosphate, one phosphate ion is lost, is broken down. When this break happens, energy is released. Okay. So the more mitochondria, more ATP. More ATP, more energy production. Okay. Is it clear? This is resting energy expenditure. Mifflin equation is given here. Mifflin equation, there are three, uh, uh, four different equations given. Go with Mifflin equation, saint Jor and Mifflin equation. It is given in this portion. Okay, that is what we usually use to calculate calories. The number of mitochondria you can only estimate under microscope. For everyone, Mifflin, Mifflin equation is universal 
not just for Indian clients, it is universal. Now coming to the factors affecting your BMR. First is your body composition. Okay. The more lean muscles you have, more will be the BMR. Okay. The more adipose tissue you have, less will be, be your BMR. This is one of the reasons why men have higher BMR as compared to women. Men naturally have high lean muscles, high amount of lean muscles as compared to women. Okay, so that be a uh, mesal metabolic rate is high. Then gender, as I mentioned, men will always have higher BMR as compared to female at any age. At any age, okay, even in childhood, teenage, adults, senior citizens, men will have a higher BMR as compared to women. This is because of male hormones, testosterone and uh, women who are in their premenstrual rise or postmenstrual fall, okay, uh, in postmenstrual stage or premenstrual stage, their basal metabolism falls, okay, it, it decreases. With age, we all know children, teenagers, young adults, their BMR is higher as compared to Older people, as you age, as aging process kicks in, as you age, you uh, from from young adults you turn into mid middle age adults, okay, then senior citizens. With age, your BMR decreases slowly, okay. Next is your body size and surface area. For example. There is a tall but thin person and there is a short and fat person. Tall and thin person, short and fat person. Whom do you think will have high, more BMR? Yes, tall and thin person will have a higher BMR because their body surface area, body size and body surface area is higher, is more than a short person and a fat person. Okay. Because when you are short and fat, okay, you don't have more body surface area. Whatever fat is there, which is, it is inside your body. Okay. The outer surface area, we are talking about the surface area. The outer surface area is quite less. Okay. But the fat content, the weight content comes more, more or less within, within your body. Okay. But when you take a tall, thin person, they naturally have higher body surface area. They have more skin exposed. Okay. They have more body exposed to the en uh, outer environment. Okay. And the fat within, the co composition with inside their body is less. Okay. So definitely more the body surface area, more will be your BMR. Okay. Then sleep. During sleeping hours, 10% of your basal metabolism is lower than in your waking state. Okay. So when you are awake, you burn more fat than when you are sleeping. When you sleep, body, body metabolism slows down. Then body temperature. Okay, your, your metabolism is higher in summer, lower in winters. You can lose weight easily in summer season, okay, but you will find it difficult to lose weight during winter season because body temperature matters, okay. And this is the reason why when you fall sick, when you have fever, okay, when you have fever, your body burns a lot of calories. Body temperature increases when you are having fever. Body burns a lot of calories. And you lose weight. Soon after fever, you will see when you are when you are recovering from fever, you you will see you have lost a bit of weight. Okay, it's because increased body temperature has burned a lot of calories. Then endocrine glands, especially thyroxine, thyroxine thyroid hormone, 
if you don't have enough thyroid thyroxine hormone secreted in your body your metabolism drops okay iron deficiency iodine deficiency will lead to thyroxine deficiency and that causes a drop in your metabolism then in pregnancy bmr will increase by 5% during the first two trimesters okay till the sixth month of pregnancy first two trimesters your bmr increases okay but during the last trimester your the 7th uh, 8th and ninth month your bmr increases by 12% okay doubles and this why because a fetus is also developing placenta is also developing a lot of energy is required for the development of fetus and placenta within the within a female uh, a mother's body okay for this development and to meet the physiological and developmental needs of the child of the unborn fetus within her the bmr has to double okay then state of nutri nutrition for example when you go for this crash diets okay fluid diet juice diet for one week to immediately lose weight when you try these kind of fat diets your bmr falls okay like within few weeks you have managed to reduce a lot of kilograms okay within one month you have lost 6 or 7 kgs okay within one month you have reduced your nutritional status your bmr falls okay and in the second month when you start eating normal your bmr cannot come drastically up based on your appetite bmr can come up only slowly okay but you will notice whatever weight you have lost double than that you have gained because your eating habits have become normal but your bmr is still was still stuck at the lower phase it was not able to catch up to your eating habits okay so state of nutrients overfeeding will slightly increase your bmr by 5 10% okay but if you still continue to overfeed yourself your bmr will not rise after a threshold okay your body size will increase okay for for a week or two you have started eating a little bit more okay your bmr increases but you still keep eating over eating your bmr will not increase after a certain threshold it will not increase but your weight what will happen you will become obese you will become overweight okay then environmental temperature as i mentioned the environment here where you live in okay if it is between the temperature is between 26 degrees celsius or less than 26 degrees celsius okay your uh, metabolic rate will be low but if you if wherever you stay the temperature is more than 30 degrees celsius automatically you will have a higher bmr then smoking smoking increases your bmr by 10% okay and it is very easy for smokers to lose weight but when the smokers habitual smokers when they stop smoking they will gain weight okay then we have genetic differences also genetic differences individuals of the same age sex and body weight fat free mass etc if all these are same of two people but still their bmr will be different because of their genetic background race also impacts your bmr then you have your physiological state of mind if there is a lot of epinephrine secretion you are always um uh, in in anxious state okay or you have a high energy uh, state okay you are in an over enthusiastic state you are in an anxious state okay a lot of epinephrine ad adrenaline is secreted in your body your bmr will be high okay smoking it increases your bmr okay because when you are smoking 
when when you're smoking you are taking in a lot of tar and it has to be oxidized okay your lungs have to have to undergo double triple the energy to oxidize and take away the tar that is that's an extra work done by your body so because of that extra calories are burned so that is one of the reason why smoking increases your bmr and keeps you lean okay but when smokers are stopping their smoking habit they will immediately gain weight because bmr will uh, will again go back to normal the body does not have to put on an extra energy to remove the tar okay if a person is feeling sad and depressed the bmr will also go down okay because it affects the appetite as well but in anxiety and when you are stressed a lot of adrenaline is pushed in, into your system okay adrenaline gives you energy then certain drugs that we use some uh, uh, nicotine nicotine which comes from smoking caffeine okay this also increases energy in small measurable uh, amounts beta blockers are a group of medicine that is supposed to treat high blood pressure hypertension patients will get beta blocker injections sorry uh, tablets that can decrease your bmr okay so that there is a tendency to for you to gain weight if a person is put on beta blockers the disease processes if you have fever or if you have cancer or your skin has undergone burns okay your bmr increases okay because the body has to do the wound healing the body has to uh, keep up with the fever temperature okay in tumors a lot of energy will be consumed by the tumorous cells cancerous growth to keep growing and growing okay so bmr increases there is not such a normal range of bmr it completely depends on your physical activity level your height and weight okay So that's about